Good evening, everyone. It's time for us to have another story hour about the life of M. L. Andreasen. And before we get started reading, let's ask God to bless our time together. If you're able, would you kneel with me, please? Father, we're very thankful for this opportunity to gather with fellow believers who um, love to learn and love to um, draw close to you. So we pray that your spirit will be among us, your angels will draw us closer together in one little group. Bless our time together, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're continuing on with um, Andreasen's life. Reading in Without Fear or Favor by Virginia Steinweg. Following his year at Battle Creek College, M.L. was asked to conduct a trial summer church school in Chicago. The schoolroom turned out to be located in a hall above a saloon on Milwaukee Avenue. And imagine children having to attend school during the summer when normally they would have been on vacation. The schoolroom was reached by climbing 23 narrow steps, and in order to keep their bicycles from being stolen, the students had to carry them up those steps. School started off by being a trial for the teacher, as well as the students. M.L. had been instructed by the school board to use nothing but the Bible as his textbook and had been taught at Battle Creek never to lay a hand on a pupil because of misconduct. M.L. soon realized that the latter instruction was impractical and so gained permission from the school board to use the rod. When he set about to discipline one student, the boy, trying to escape, jumped out a window, fortunately landing a straddle the tavern sign. The next morning he arrived at school brandishing a revolver. M.L. deftly overpowered him and tied him up with a rope. Then the children conducted a formal trial and sentenced him to a deserved punishment, which was duly carried out. The summer went along satisfactorily after that. The conference then asked ML to help L.H. Christian conduct tent meetings for Scandinavians in Chicago. The two hit upon a novel publicity plot. While Elder Christian was preaching, M.L., acting as if he were a stranger, got up and objected to something he said and challenged him to a debate. The speaker agreed. The public was delighted. The next evening the tent was packed with listeners eager to see those two preachers get at each other. The lot on which M.L. and L.H. had pitched their tent was right beside the new elevated railroad. For decibel strength, that was the 1900 equivalent of having jet planes take off over one's head every few minutes. Both preachers developed their lung capacity to the full while competing with those trains. Soon M.L.'s voice gave him trouble. He developed greatly enlarged tonsils, which were removed by an operation in a doctor's office. Returning home after the operation, M.L. had to stand on the back platform of the streetcar to spit out blood. It took two subsequent operations to succeed in eradicating them. The family income was provided by the Sunday night collection. If these collections exceeded two dollars, the overflow was then to be turned over to the conference. 
the peanut age began in Battle Creek. The Andresen family, in line with the times, bought peanuts in quantity, lots in quantity lots, and baked them, boiled them, ground them, mixed them with water, subsisted on them. But despite their full stomachs, the little girls suffered from malnutrition, especially was one-year-old Eunice laid low. A sanitarium doctor prescribed beaten egg thickened with granola. Vesta was grateful to get what little left was left over. Eunice recovered, but it was years before her stomach returned to normal. None of the family wanted to see peanut butter again. Shortly after Eunice's sickness, Mrs. Andreasen experienced a health crisis, developing a high fever that burned unremittingly for several days. Sabbath morning, Annie, who had great faith in the prayers of Andrew Christensen, elder of the local Scandinavian church, asked her husband to send for him. M. L. arranged for him to come during church service so that none of the members would know. According to Christensen's account, a Mrs. Benny Iverson had, been, had an idea that something was going to happen and went to Annie's bedside instead of to church. Brother Christensen solemnly anointed Annie, then called for prayer. As she was weakly fingering the bedclothes, her lips moved almost inaudibly. Then I'll get up. When the earnest prayers of the little group were finished, what was M.L.'s amazement to see his wife sit up in bed and begin to sing. She was healed. All M.L. could say, O oh ye, of little faith. Not all experiences ended so happily, M.L. writes. At one time, I was preaching on Fullerton Avenue in Chicago. We had a string quartet in which I played the cello. Not very proficiently, it must be confessed, especially in view of the fact that two of the other men were music teachers. One night... After we had played, a man came to the platform, partly under the influence of liquor. With some difficulty, he inquired of me, Did you ever play that thing before? Referring to the cello. I admitted that I had not played much. Let me have at it, he said. I invited him to come back when he was sober, and I would try him out. And he came back. And how he could play! He played till tears ran down the faces of those not ordinarily affected by music. And he kept coming back. He came to our meetings again and again, and at last accepted Christ. Then one day I received a hurry-up message. The man had committed suicide. The bottle had been too much for him. He had taken a drink, and the shame and disgrace of what he had done overwhelmed him. It was one of the saddest funerals at which I ever officiated. M.L. tells this story, which has a very different emotional impact. I was in Illinois when the first telephone line was stretched in a certain rural district. One farmer was skeptical of the newfangled idea. He had heard of speaking tubes before, but he was sure that no speaking tube several miles in length would ever work. His astonishment was unbounded when the thing did work and when he discovered that the wire was not hollow at all, 
as he had thought, but solid. He could conceive of a speaking tube, but a solid wire? How was it possible to send words through such a contraption? It was uncanny, and he would have none of it. M.L. managed to do more than one thing at a time all his life long. While in Chicago, he squeezed in some time at the university. Among other subjects, he learned a little Greek. In 1902, at the age of 26, M.L. was ordained. Now at last he could sit on the platform. In those days, even if a man was going to speak, he could not sit on the platform unless he was ordained. He had to sit on the front seat. The general conference session of 1905 was held in Washington, D.C. M.L. attended. En route to Washington in early May, Ellen White and other delegates from California learned about the availability of the Loma Linda property. During the conference, telegrams and letters were going back and forth, encouraging the purchase of the site of the denomination's future medical headquarters. At this 1905 general conference session, an unexpected learning opportunity came to M.L. and his young friend from Chicago, L.H. Christian. It centered upon what became known as the Ballinger Trial. More than half a century later, M.L. recounted the story. Excuse me. These are M.L.'s words. <clears throat> Elder Ballinger was well-liked, and it was a shock to all of us when he was cited for heresy and told to appear for, for trial, which was held at the time of the General Conference in Washington, D.C. in 1905. The first General Conference held there. A large tent had been erected for the meetings on the school grounds. There were some small buildings, one of which was used for the trial, which became known as the, quote, secret trial, end quote, because only the older and more prominent ministers were permitted to attend the hearing. Brethren Daniels, Evans, Haskell, Prescott, Gilbert, Shaw, and Spicer were in constant attendance. Elder L.H. Christian and I were at the conference, <clears throat> but we were not admitted to the hearing. Though we were ordained, we were not considered old enough. But there was a window on the side of the building, the upper sash of which was lowered when it got too warm inside. Alas, neither of us w was tall enough to take advantage of it. But we decided that if one would sit on the shoulders of the other, he would have a good view and could hear. So we decided to take turns standing and sitting, and it worked satisfactorily. However, truth compels me to report that I did more standing than sitting. But I got a good oral report from Brother Christian. The arrangement was satisfactory. The second day, we made an appointment with Elder Ballinger, which was not hard, for he was already being shunned, and it was not considered safe to associate too much with him. These interviews were very profitable to me and uh, were the beginning of a great interest in the sanctuary and the atonement from w which lasted throughout life. From Ballinger, I got both sides of the arguments as he recited what was going on. But one day, Elder Daniels came by, and we thought we were surely in for a hard time, as he called us in to talk with us. But the only thing that concerned him was that 
two young ministers sat with their feet up on the chair. This was worse, we were told, than to go without a hat, which Brother Gilbert always did and for which he had been reprimanded. Brother Daniels was faultless, faultlessly attired, and he wanted all his ministers to be the same. We both duly repented. Till this day, I am glad for those talks, for it gave me a preliminary course in these most important subjects of the sanctuary and the atonement, which have been altogether too much neglected. As far as I know, Sister White did not attend the trial in person, but she did send a message to the leaders involving Elder Ballinger. I have this before me as I write, she said. Elder Ballinger's proofs are not reliable. If received, they would destroy the faith of God's people in the truth that has made us what we are. With this support from the spirit of prophecy and their own convictions, the brethren unanimously voted Elder Ballinger's exclusion from the ministry. Thus, near the close of his first denominational assignment, Andreasen found his attention focused on the sanctuary and the atonement, which continue to be of special interest to him throughout his life and which involved him in a controversy with some of the brethren during his last years. After five years in Chicago, M.L. was transferred to Brooklyn, New York, where he continued working among Scandinavians. Now he writes, the first thing I noticed as I arrived at the church for my first service in this new parish was an undertaker's sign on the church. It was neatly painted and it gave information which would be needed should an emergency arise. I concluded that one of the members was in the business and that the church had permitted him to put the sign up as a matter of accommodation to him. However, upon inquiry, I found that this was not the case. I was informed that churches of all denominations had such signs and that it was one of the customs of the city. At our first business meeting, I asked for further particulars and suggested that the sign be taken down. This, however, the brethren did not think best to do. Then came my first funeral. A poor sister had lost her husband. The undertaker in question was called, and I was asked to preach the sermon. This I did to the best of my ability. On the way home, I rode with the undertaker high up on one of the old-fashioned hearses used in those days. After due preliminaries, he handed me a five-dollar bill. I asked what that was for, and he informed me that this was for my part of the funeral. When I inquired further how it came about that he was paying me, he explained that it was the custom in that city for the undertaker to include in his fee for services a certain amount for the minister. He regretted that this was um, not, an, uh, let's see, he regretted that as this was not an expensive funeral, five dollars was all he could pay me. When I indignantly refused his offer, he stated that he might be able to make it a little more, but not much, for he himself was making but small profit on this funeral. He had not only had to pay the drivers of the carriages, this was in the horse and buggy days, but all of them would also expect extra tips. If these were not paid, 
untoward events, and even accidents might happen. And in a short time, his business would be ruined. When I told him that I could not accept the money as a matter of principle, he said little more, I was a newcomer and I would soon learn. Then I did some thinking. What should I have done? All I had accomplished was to hand the undertaker five dollars. The widow had paid it. I had lost it. The undertaker had it. Perhaps it would have been better to accept the money. I could have given it back to the widow, but it was too late this time. But next time, I would know better. It was the same undertaker next time. This time, I received $10 and made no objections to accepting the money, but felt it my duty to explain why I had changed my mind. I told the undertaker that I intended to give the money to the widow. This, evidently, I should not have told him. He looked at me in a queer way and said nothing. But I felt that he did not believe that I was telling the truth. He thought I was a hypocrite and a liar. Other ministers were at least honest and took the money, but I was trying to make him believe that I was going to give it back to the widow. I felt thoroughly miserable. It was not as easy for ministers to be honest as I had thought it was. One of the first things the church members did for M.L. was to provide him with a Prince Albert coat, without which no Scandinavian priest was properly attired. Naturally, he took the best possible care of it. Soon after his family was settled in Brooklyn, M.L. began a series of evangelistic meetings in a tent pitched on an empty lot not far from the docks. One day it became necessary to make some repairs on the tent. After the morning sun grew warm, he pulled off the neat sweater Annie had knitted for him. When he was ready to go home at noon, the sweater was nowhere to be found. He was standing in his, sle in his sleeveless undershirt. Then he remembered his frock co coat hanging for safekeeping in the closet of a church member who lived nearby. He soon had his Prince Albert atop his overalls and with the solemnity befitting a clergyman rode home on the streetcar. <clears throat> The place where he was holding his meetings was known as a tough area. One of his annoyances was that boys would throw stones onto the tent during the meetings just to see them roll down the slanting sides. M.L. soon learned that he would need police protection, and then he states, I was told that I would never get it unless I was willing to grease the policeman's palms. Ten dollars would do, I was told. I decided not to pay any graft, and as I was given assurance by the police captain that there would be a policeman there the next night, I thought all was well. But there was no policeman, and we had more disturbance than ever. It was the same the next night, and the meetings were in a fair way to be ru ruined. Still, I was determined not to pay. But the next night all was well. There was no disturbance. I had won out, I thought. A few weeks later, I learned that one of my friends had given the policeman the necessary money. By this time, it had become clear to me that the life of a minister is rather complicated I decided that ministers are not exempt from troubles. Meetings were held every night but Monday. The doctrines were taught straight from the shoulder, 
the beasts, the papacy, everything. Most of the Scandinavian hearers were reared as Lutherans, but when they decided to change, they really did. Quite a number who accepted the message at the time became staunch workers in the denomination. ML completed <laughs> two important secular activities during his five years in Brooklyn. First, he passed the New York Regents examinations, which qualified him to be accepted in any American university. Two of his exams were scheduled for the same time. He finished one, then went to write the other, finishing both within the allotted time. Then on June 17, 1909, Millian Lawrence Andreessen became a citizen of the United States of America, age 33, height 5 feet 7 and a half inches, eyes gray, hair brown, previous to his naturalization a subject of Denmark. Whether one was naturalized was dependent no whether one was naturalized depended considerably on the judge. M. L. tells his story. When I applied for citizenship, I had to fill out papers telling where I came from and so on. The paper asked what boat I came on. I had not come on any boat. I had just stepped aboard the train at Gretna, and that was all. That was most illegal and would complicate matters. I had two witnesses that I that I had been in the country the necessary length of time to acquire citizenship to Seventh-day Adventist ministers. The opposing lawyer, however, protested my application and made quite a speech against my application. <clears throat> I was given quite a test on my knowledge of the Constitution, which I passed successfully, but my opposing lawyer was not satisfied. There must be something wrong with a man who just stepped on board a train and came into the States without any entrance permit. Anyway, how did anyone know how long I had been in the United States? The law required that I be here five years. My two witnesses were called. Did they know that I had been here that length of time? They said that they had known me longer than that. They had seen me at camp meetings and other places. The lawyer fumed. He had not asked how long they had known me. The law required that I present proof that I was here five years ago, that is, on the 17th day of June, 1904. Speaking to each of my witnesses, he wanted to know where they had seen me on the 17th of June, 1904. Neither could give the demanded information. They had both known me before and after that date, but the lawyer demanded proof that I had been here on that particular date. So most solemnly he protested against my becoming a United States citizen. Well, the judge was a kind, sensible man. He said, Well, these are all ministers and apparently good men. There doubtless was some irregularity in his entering the way he did, but anyway, I never heard that it was necessary to prove that a man had to be here just five years on the date and produce witnesses to that effect. So I overruled the objection of the learned learned counsel and swear in, in this man as a lawful citizen. When the three of us got out of the courthouse that day, we were all sweating and felt we had had a great deliverance. After arriving in Brooklyn, Andreasen was made a member of the conference committee. In 1908, he became conference president. 
The 1909 General Conference Bulletin includes a picture of a camp meeting he conducted in New York City. The rows of family tents and the big tent under the shadow of the six-story skyscrapers. A horse and buggy is passing in front of the tents, and horses and wagons are laboring along farther down the street. In May 1909, ML again attended a general conference session held in tents under the trees of the campus of Washington Missionary College, now Columbia Union College, and now in our day, Washington Adventist University. He was one of 199 delegates representing the nearly 60,000 members in North America. 129 others represented the 24,000 overseas members. Delegates gave reports from such places as the German Union, the Russian Confederates Conference, the Heart of Africa, the China Union, the East Indian Field under the care of Australia, the Scandinavian Union, Japan, Korea, Mexico, Lake Titicaca, Polynesia, and the West Indies. This was the last general conference session that Ellen White attended. ML heard her speak eight times. Once was on a risen Savior. The other times she spoke of various phases of the health message, especially on the College of Medical Evangelists, Loma Linda. The autumn of the following year, this college was to be authorized to grant medical degrees. On the last day of the session, ML saw Mrs. White go to the platform to speak a farewell word to the delegates who would soon be returning to the four corners of the earth. He wondered what her final message would be. After a few words of good cheer and farewell, she turned to the pulpit on which lay a Bible. Opening it, she held it up with hands that trembled with age. Brethren and sisters, I commend unto you this book, she closed the book and walked down from the platform. She had spoken her last word to the assembled delegates of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Of special interest to Andreasen and his corps of workers was the memorial they had prepared for F.C. Gilbert, a convert of Jewish parentage working among the Jewish people. Uh, and was to be read to the assembly, quote, a large proportion, more than half of five million, of the five million of New York City, is foreign-born. It is stated that in greater New York missions should be established where workers can be trained, that a center here uh, should be made, that the work done should be a symbol of the work the Lord wants done in all the world, and that a specialty should be made of this field. Your memorialists would respectfully urge that steps be taken at this conference to place Greater New York on the footing spoken of in the foregoing extracts, with two exceptions, we do not own a single church building in the whole city or conference. M.L. and his associates could not know that it would be nearly 50 years until the establishment of the Times Square Evangelistic Center and that in 1977, five conferences and two unions would cooperate to develop the Metro ministry, and you may remember the Metro ministry 
had little uh, vans, not little vans, but vans where people could walk in the front, sit down, get their blood pressures taken, perhaps receive a piece of literature, and exit out the back door. They had a, a health ministry um, in one sense. And that's the end <laughs> of our reading today. We have to close. That closes the chapter, and we will pick up, Lord willing, next Monday at 7 p.m. I hope this has been a blessing to you. We're going to close with prayer now. Father, we're so thankful for the example and the words written about ML Andreasen, and we pray that we will be good workers for you also, that you will bless us with your spirit, that you will give us wisdom, guidance, knowledge, uh, all the fruit of the spirit, so that wherever we are at and Whoever we come in whomever we come in contact with, we may be a blessing. So please be with each one this night and through the coming days. May they um, be safe and healthy and um, your children walking closely with you, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, may God bless and keep you. And thank you for joining us. Bye for now. <music>